So this morning I'm talking about this uh, subject, this title is called Fix It. I think we'll have a picture there. Fix It, Life in Progress. Life is a progress, right? It's, it's, it's process, it's a continual process in our life. And um, my object this morning is to show you that God's desire is for you to have joy more than happiness and also how to grow joy in our lives. So that's, that's my ob objective this morning. Uh, so on this uh, slide, you see a picture of a house, part of a house. And uh, we all live in a house of some kind, right? Some may be bigger, some may be smaller. Some may live in the dog house. Well, that should be your dog. Um, so we all live in a house of some kind. And um, when, we, when we have a house, whether we own it, whether we rent it, there's always things that fall apart, things that need to be repaired, things that need to be replaced, things that need to be fixed. You know, drywall needs to be fixed, especially if you have boys playing hockey inside. Hey, guys. Hey. Um, I didn't play hockey inside, but I did other things that made holes in walls and ceilings. But my parents aren't here this morning, so I can say that. Paint needs to be redoed, redone, right? You want to renew your paint, so you redo it. Uh, wood, sometimes wood, if you have like an exterior that's uh, a wood finish, uh, you better stay on top of maintaining that, right? Otherwise, it turns pretty ugly, and, and eventually it's a, it's a big job renewing it back to looking good. Uh, shingles break down, I have to reshingle, and and all these things, right, they come with, with having a house, with having a place to live in. And, and our lives are, uh, to some extent, the same way. Uh, Jesus said, he, he used this picture of the wise man builds his house on the rock, and the foolish man builds his house on the sand, right? So he's talking about a house and our life being kind of pictured as a house. And Jesus is, is the rock, and when we build on him, we build on a firm foundation, and when we don't build on him, then we're on shifting sand, right, that, can, that our house can break down on. When, we, when storms of life come, it shakes and it goes apart, um, our spiritual life. And so the Apostle Paul, in fact, calls this being renewed, right? He talks about continually renewing our mind, continually renewing and, and bringing ourselves uh, closer to the image of Christ, right? Closer to the heart of Christ. And we could say that's what we do in our life. And uh, so I want to talk about that this morning, about some things that, that can make our lives fall apart when, I talk, when I'm talking about faith, making our faith fall apart, or faith in Christ. There's a, there's a house that gets visited uh, quite a bit. Thousands of people, people a year visit this house. It's called... The Winchester Mansion. Anybody ever heard of it? Winchester Mansion? No? Anybody ever heard of Winchester? There's got to be a few of you, yeah? Yeah? There's a, there's a gun that's called Winchester, yeah? Okay. So now all of a sudden we get some, some connecting here. And so here's a house. It's called the Winchester Mansion. And um, so the gentleman that started the Winchester Company, when he passed away, his, his wife his widow started building this house in, in 1884. And for 38 years, she built this house. She had crews continually adding, continually renovating, continually working in this house for 38 years straight. And it only stopped when she passed away. And so this, you know, okay, how could that be? 38 years on that house? Well, I'll show you another picture. There's, there's a picture of this house. And so somehow she had this idea that, that uh, with, with all the evil that came from, from using guns the wrong way, she felt like she had to keep building her house somehow to deal with these, these evils that her husband had, I guess, caused, or at least what she thought. And so she was haunted by this thing uh, for whatever reason. There was... More than 10,000 windows in this uh, structure here. That's, that's, uh, that would be a window cleaning job for somebody. Uh, about 160 rooms in total. 
And they say that she, it was estimated that she spent $70 million in today's money in this project. It was all a search for peace that ultimately didn't bring her peace, right? But nonetheless, our lives, our lives are a continual building process as well, even though our houses shouldn't be. And so I'll talk about one thing that can uh, tear down our house, if we want to consider our life a house, and it's this. It's an unscriptural belief that God wants me to be happy. It's not scriptural. Now, yeah, I think he, he, he delights in us being happy, but I want to go deeper than that. If, if our pursuit in life is just to be happy, happiness is connected to an event. Happiness is connected to an emotion. Happiness is connected, connected to our circumstance. So what we know is that when our circumstances change, then happiness wants to disappear, right? We get into, a, uh, we experience a circumstance that isn't what we enjoy, then all of a sudden we're not happy anymore, right? It's an unscriptural belief. It erodes the structure of our faith, and it causes unfruitfulness in an area of our life, and eventually will cause our faith to collapse, more than likely. Uh, when I did some house rentals a few years ago, and I pulled the exterior off of our house, and we were going to put new exterior on, and and then I discovered under one window, I guess we had wood-framed windows, and the windows had gotten bad. And I discovered that moisture had got into the wall, and now I had this when I pulled the exterior off, and all of a sudden I had, you know, plywood rotted out. I had two-by-sixes that were barely hanging together. And so here, all of a sudden, oh, i got a problem. i got to fix this before I put the new exterior on, right? And so I think that's how unscriptural beliefs work in our spiritual lives. We may not necessarily see it on the outside, but when we hit against things, you know, uh, we hit against this thing and we think, okay, God wants me to be happy, and then we have a circumstance that takes our happiness away. Then we start doubting. What does it mean that God cares? What does it mean that God looks after his, his people? What does it mean that God loves me? What does that mean? We start doubting that, right? So I think it's an unscriptural belief that God wants me to be happy. This guy, did I just pass that? Here, Charles M. Schultz, who made cartoons, he uh, said that happiness is a warm puppy. Uh, I don't agree with that, but you may have, I know, there's, there's somebody is very excited up front here. Happiness is a warm puppy, but I think it's deeper than that. I'll, I'll, I'll let Roberta have the puppy. So let's look at a few examples of how, how happiness, because I think God wants, desire is for us to have joy. Not just happiness. God's desire is for us to have joy. You know, some of the ways that people look for happiness is, uh, they say, God wants me to be happy, so I'm going to, you know, I'm going to borrow money so I can buy this thing. Because that thing will make me happy. Well, then, then we see these, credit card commercials, right? You know, oh, here's the answer. Use the card. That'll, you know, get you what you need to be happy in life. Uh, what they don't show you is how many people are actually broke and, and are struggling to make payments on their card, right? And when they've used the card to buy something in order to try and achieve happiness in their life. Or, or maybe they go with this... Uh, this, I, this thing, this zero down, six months, no payments, or whatever. It's even up to maybe 12 or 24 months already. I don't know. And so they think, okay, you know, hey, that should be easy to do. I'll just, you know, make this deal. I'll go get this thing. Zero down. I don't have money right now. But when those six months come up, I'll have money for sure. And so often we, people will find out. And I, I've been there. I've done this in my past years and said I would never do it again. But maybe I will. And uh, so we find out when we get there, we find out, oh, I actually didn't save up the money. So now I have to find a way to, to make the money, right? And so people are in, in financial bondage, right? And, or maybe people say that, hey, God wants me to be happy, so it's okay to lust. It's okay to desire somebody who isn't mine. Or, 
or, or God wants me to be happy, so I'll just, I'll just party it up. I'll just have a party. You know, that's, that's important to God because he wants me to be happy. You know, it's uh, another commercial that we see if you watch TV or you go on TV or something and you see there's uh, liquor commercials and they, you know, always present this picture of, oh, this brings happiness. You know, we'll just party it up and we ha we're happy. And they, they don't show you the after effects of people that have become addicted, you know, to alcohol, to drugs or whatever and, and are dealing with circumstances in their life that, that are far from happy, right? And so, so these are examples of how this idea of that God wants me to be happy, how it backfires in us. Um, I, quite a few years ago, I, I uh, did some, some mission work, and I went to Union Gospel Mission uh, for a few, few years, once a month. And so we would, me and my, it started off with, I think, me and my brother, and we would go there and we would sing, and we would play for these folks. And um, I, learned, I saw a lot of people that were searching for happiness. And they'd ended up in some very desperate situations in, in, on the streets and in their own personal lives. And so it was good to, to serve them and bring them hope and show them that Jesus cares for them. But a lot of people that had lost happiness in their life um, maybe people say, hey, God wants me to be happy, so it's okay if I'm a bit dishonest to make money. Or, uh, God wants me to be happy, so I'll spend time doing something else than spending time in his word that I really need to build relationship. But, you know, God wants me to be happy, so it's okay. So we, we want to be in this happy place, right? We want to be in this happy place. But God wants us to live in joy. God wants us to live in joy. In the New Testament, the term that conveys the idea of happiness is a word that's uh, makarios, usually rendered blessed, blessed. So often in the New Testament, we'll read about blessed. You know, Jesus spoke on Sermon on the Mount, and he said, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the, the poor, blessed are those that mourn. He, he said all this, right? And, and what Jesus meant is, that circumstance isn't, might not be a happy circumstance, but they have something deeper. They have access to something deeper that is actually more of a joy. R.C. Sproul said, Blessed communicates not only the idea of happiness, but also profound peace, comfort, stability, and great joy. See, the heart of the New Testament concept is this. A person can have biblical joy even when he is mourning, suffering, or undergoing difficult circumstances. This is because the person's mourning is directed toward, toward one concern. But at the same moment, he possesses a measure of joy. So it's okay. We, we get into tough uh, circumstances, and it's okay that we admit that. There's we don't want to live in denial. We want to admit that we're, oh, we're battling. We're dealing with some tough things. But in the midst of that, Jesus is offering us joy. In the midst of that, there's something deeper. There's a deeper foundation that's called joy. That's what Jesus still has available for us regardless of our circumstance. Happiness as we understand it is too shallow. Jesus has joy for us. See, I think joy functions when our feelings and emotions are submitted to Jesus. Joy functions when our feelings and emotions are submitted to Jesus. In John 15, uh, Jesus is talking about that he is the vine, and if, when we follow him as Christ followers, we are the branches. And he says we need to be plugged into the vine in order to receive that life from him that he gives, right? And this can, in this case we could say the joy that he gives in John 15 verse 9 to 11 says this I have loved you even as the father has loved me remain in my love <clears throat> when you obey my commandments you remain in my love just as I obey my father's commandments and remain in his love and then the next verse says this I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy yes your joy will overflow Jesus wants our joy to overflow. 
He wants us to be filled and not just for ourselves, but he also wants it to overflow into the lives of those around us. And so it's difficult to see our troubles and our trying times as a reason to rejoice, right? Uh, how many of you, when you get that flat tire wanting to go to work and you say, oh, this, is, this isn't just my happy place here right now. I wasn't happy before, but now I'm really happy. Or, or, or maybe you uh, write a test and you say, I'm sure I get at least 98%. I may not get 100, but 98 for sure. And then you get it back and it's like 84. Oh, this is, oh, I'm rejoicing, right? My happiness that I had is just plummeted, right? If I'm, if I'm just dealing with my circumstance, if that's what I'm basing it on, it's just, it's disappeared. Or maybe you're a big sports fan and your team has a pretty awful game and you were pretty happy when the game started and by the time the game is over, talking to myself, uh, my happiness has disappeared. So I have to find something else to be happy about, right? No, we can have something deeper. We can have the joy of the Lord as our true foundational joy. Uh, it could be a business deal. Maybe, maybe as a business person, we think, well, we've got this figured out. This and this and this will happen. And I'll make this deal. And then, oh, we've got a plan for, for the future or for the next year or five or whatever. And then all of a sudden, that plan falls apart. And then our happiness disappears, right? So what are we basing life on? Is there something deeper than that? So the question I think for us is, are we pursuing happiness or are we living in joy? Are we pursuing happiness or are we living in joy? And often we'll be happy and we should be happy. I think as, as children of God, if we don't have a reason to have a smile on our face, uh, then, then, then we don't understand what Christ has done for us. So we want to live in a place of, of portraying happiness or being happy people, but it doesn't mean we deny the tough times that we go through. Can we go through the tough times in life but still have joy? Let's not be content with just the occasional happy stretch. Let's search for deeper joy. See, joy, if we look at the word joy, J-O-Y, if we live life in this order, if we put Jesus first, others second, and yourself last, you have access to, hap to, to joy, not just happiness. No, sometimes our self needs to come before others, but I think the important key here is Jesus needs to come first. Je Jesus needs to come first. So we have full access to the joy that he gives. So how... How can we experience more joy? First one is this. I'll, I'll skip a verse there. So the first one is this. Be reconciled to God. See, we can experience more joy. Uh, to experience more joy, we need to be reconciled to God. See, when we come to Christ in the first, the first place, we are reconciled to him, right? Our, our sins are forgiven. Jesus has covered them on the cross. And when we receive that gift, we have full forgiveness. We, our sins are always covered under the cross. But then what about uh, other areas of life? Are they, or do we keep reconciling to God in those things? Romans 4, 48 says this. When people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. And there it is. And it said, he said, David said this, verse 7. He said, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight, Yes, what joy for those who reco whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. Isn't that awesome? So when we live from that place, then we are plugging into this well of joy. What joy for those who, whose disobedience is forgiven. All of us have been disobedient, but our, joy, our disobedience has been forgiven by the blood of Jesus. So 
We don't just receive this forgiveness, but now we accept Jesus as Lord of our life and plug into him as the vine. And we're now living from a place of surrender to his will for us, right? Tony Nolan said this, the highs in your life will never be higher than your hurts. The highs in your life will never be higher than your hurts. See, if we live in a place of, of not being reconciled, you know, it could be to God. Maybe we're disappointed in God. Or maybe we're disappointed in somebody else and, and we've, we live in this place of, of hurt all the time. Our highs cannot go past that hurt. Then we all of a sudden have to depend on happiness because it hinders our joy. Hurting people look for, for fulfillment, by, fulfillment by finding happiness. But joy is found in receiving the forgiveness of Jesus. Living the will of Jesus connects us to this well of joy. So we need to live in reconciliation. In Christ, we are fully accepted and forgiven for all eternity. So that's the first thing. Second thing is this. We need to rejoice always. See, the, this word rejoice, it, give, it carries this concept of redoing. You know, when you, when you uh, renew something, it's been new once, but now you're making it new again. You're renewing. You're redoing it. Uh, rejoice, the same thing. So we're living in joy, we're living with the joy of the Lord, and then we, we hit something in life, and it wants to take that joy away. What do we do now? Do we accept that? Do we accept that that joy can be taken away out of our life, and we say, well, I guess it's just, you know, this is just what life is, and go into the, the dumps? Or do we say, no, I can come back to joy. I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to renew that joy in my life. I'm going to go and get that joy again. I'm going to plug into Christ. I'm going to accept what he has for me. I'm going to take the joy that he offers. Renew or rejoice always. The Apostle Paul wrote this in Philippians 4. He wrote the book when he was sitting in prison. And he, was, he didn't know if his life would be taken from him. And then he wrote in Philippians 4 verse 4, he says, Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again rejoice. So even Paul had to remind the early church. I mean, if you read some history, some early church history, you know, we, we can see that life for them was not, not easy. We can see that, right? And for Paul, it was not easy. It was a, a big struggle at times. And he says, rejoice. Let's go back to that well. Let's go back when our joy dries up. Let's go back to the well of joy, which is Jesus Christ. It's not depend on something else to bring us that joy. Joy is found in meditating on the things of the Lord. When our mind is full of other things, and then we need to pull it back and say, okay, God, help me to meditate on the things of the Lord. Help me to meditate on whatever is pure, true, honorable, just, right, like Philippians 4 verse 8 says. Help me to think of those things. Let me not get wound up in this circumstance or these feelings of despair or, you know, maybe this discouragement that I just didn't get better result on my test. There's no point in studying because I just can't do better. No, let's go back and let's think on whatever is pure, true, holy, honorable, just, all these good things that come from Christ. And then third, third thing is this. Let's trust or believe in God's power to lead us. Let's trust or believe. So we've got to stand on this trust. We've got to stand on it. Romans 15, 13 says this, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. See, when, when our trust is in him, like it says here, then we, it's, it doesn't say maybe, it says you will. Well, that's hard to believe, right? That's hard to believe for me sometimes, that I will. But I have found that out in my life that the, the more I can trust God with the circumstance, or when I can trust God with the circumstance, let's not think that we have to have a certain level of faith before it's faith. If you have faith, you have faith. When I have trust, faith is basically trust. And I think 
Maybe Pastor Irwin even said that recently, or somebody did. Um, you cannot have trust and faith. Uh, you cannot have trust without faith. Or you cannot have faith without trust. See, they're completely connected. If you trust something, you'll have faith. You can have faith in it. If you don't trust something, you, you can't have faith in it, right? So let us trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to continually do this work in us, renewing us, helping us, growing us, and we want to trust in him. Jesus said in his teachings often, he said, fear not. So we see that Jesus recognized that fear, which takes trust away, so often it will destroy faith. It will destroy faith. Fear not. When we feel fear in our life, let's just bring it to Christ and believe that our trust in him is more powerful than this, this fear, this thing in my life that I fear. And let's just be honest to God and say, God, this is how I feel. Jesus, this is, this is how I feel in a moment. But I believe that you are more powerful. You are bigger. You are stronger. It's not enough to say, fear not, but it becomes a reality as we press in prayer and fellowship with our Heavenly Father. And so I think that joy, joy is okay with admitting that nothing, not everything is good in your life. See, joy is okay with admitting that. But you are secure in a God that is more powerful than your circumstance. You are secure in that place. So I think that's what's important is to have joy, we got to have that security in our life. we got to believe that. John, I read a few verses out of John 15 at the beginning. There's three things that Jesus tells us in the verses of, in John 15, 5 to 11. He, he tells us this. He tells us that the joy Jesus wants to see in us is his joy. It's his joy. See, it's not, not about our joy. It's about his joy in us. That's what he wants to see in us. Our joy may dry up, but his joy is an everlasting well that we can keep coming back to again and again and again. And so also he wants his joy to remain in us. He doesn't actually want it to keep leaving. He actually wants it to remain in us. And then he wants our joy to be full. Not just a partial cup of joy, but a full cup that's overflowing. So, are you plugged into that vine? Are you plugged into that vine of Jesus Christ? If you are, that's where you can go for strength. That's where you can go for joy. When we abide in Him as the vine, there is always more joy to be had. There is always more joy to be had. I just thank God that He doesn't give up on us. See, in it, Wherever you are today, he does not look at you with condemnation. He does not look with, at you saying, and saying that, wow, this person should already be further. This person has been my child for 30 years, 50, 10, 2, whatever. Should already be further. That's not how Jesus does it. He always invites us back to him. He, he welcomes us with open arms and he says, just come to me. And I will give you rest. And I will help you live in more joy i will do that let's do that let's let's pray as we close god thank you this morning that uh, that you have uh, received us completely through the blood of jesus you have received us a hundred percent there's nothing left for us to do and so as we understand that and as we come back to that truth and we see that often we are we feel like well life isn't going good and you know, I'm not happy, I'm not, this doesn't make me happy, that doesn't make me happy. And we live in a place of discouragement or disappointment. And yet you offer joy to us. Jesus, we just come and we want to plug into that vine, as you say, Jesus, even more. We want to continually draw from that the strength of our being. We want to ask you, Jesus, to, 
to give us joy in those areas that we need joy. Knowing that you are a faithful God and that you love each one here. Thank you for your faithfulness. Amen. Hey, if you